Part 3 of The Edge of the Knife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Giulio Marchini. The Edge of the Knife by H. Bing Piper. Part 3. The picture, a random choice among the three shows in the neighborhood, was about 17th century buccaneers. Exciting action and a soundtrack loud with shots and cutlass clashing. He let himself be drawn into it completely, and, until it was finished, he was able to forget both the college and the history of the future. But, as he walked home, he was struck by the parallel between the buccaneers of the West Indies and the space pirates in the days of the dissolution of the First Galactic Empire in the tenth century of the interstellar era. He hadn't been too clear on that period, and he found new data rising in his mind. He hurried his steps, almost running upstairs to his room. It was long after midnight before he had finished the notes he had begun on his return home. Well, that had been a mistake, but he wouldn't make it again. He determined again to destroy his notes, and began casting about for a subject which would occupy his mind to the exclusion of the future. Not the Spanish conquistadores. That was too much like the early period of interstellar expansion. He thought for a time of the Sepoy mutiny, and then rejected it. He could remember something much like that on one of the planets of the Beta Hydrae system in the fourth century of the Atomic Era. There were so few things in the history of the past which did not have their counterparts in the future. That evening, too, he stayed at home preparing for his various classes for the rest of the week and making copious notes on what he would talk about to each. He needed more whiskey to get to sleep that night. Whitburn gave him no more trouble, and if any of the trustees or influential alumni made any protest about what had happened in modern history for, he heard nothing about it. He managed to conduct his classes without further incidents and spent his evenings trying, not always successfully, to avoid drifting into memories of the future. He came into his office that morning tired and unrefreshed by the few hours sleep he had gotten the night before, edgy from the strain of trying to adjust his mind to the world of Blandley College in mid-April of 1973. Potgeiter hadn't arrived yet, but Marjorie Fenner was waiting for him, a newspaper in her hand almost bursting with excitement. Here. Have you seen it, Dr. Chalmers? she asked as he entered. He shook his head. He ought to read the papers more to keep track of the advancing knife edge that divided what he might talk about from what he wasn't supposed to know, but each morning he seemed to have less and less time to get ready for work. Well, look, look at that! She thrust the paper into his hands, still folded, the big black headline where he could see it. Khalid ibn Hussein assassinated. He glanced over the leading paragraphs. Leader of Islamic Caliphate shot to death in Basra, leaving Parliament building for his palace outside the city. Fanatic, identified as an Egyptian named Mohammed Nurid, old American submachine gun, two guards killed and a third seriously wounded, seized by infuriated mob and stoned to death on the spot. For a moment he felt guilt until he realized that nothing he could have done could have altered the event. The death of Khalid ibn Hussein and all the millions of other deaths that would follow it were fixed in the matrix of the space-time continuum, including, maybe, the death of an obscure professor of modern history named Edward Chalmers. At least this will be the end of that silly flap about what happened a month ago in Modern 4. This is modern history now, I can't talk about it without a lot of fools yelling their heads off. She stared at him wide-eyed, no doubt horrified at his cold-blooded attitude toward what was really a shocking and senseless crime. Yes, of course, the man's dead, so's Julius Caesar, but we've gotten over being shocked at his murder. He would have to talk about it in modern history for, he supposed, explain why Halid's death was necessary to the policies of the Eastern Axis and what the consequences would be, 
how it would hasten the complete dissolution of the old UN already weakened by the crisis over the eastern demands for the demilitarization and the internationalization of the United States lunar base and necessitate the formation of the Terran Federation and how it would lead eventually to the Thirty Days War. No, he couldn't talk about that. That was on the wrong side of the knife edge. Have to be careful about the knife edge. Too easy to cut himself on it. Nobody in Modern History 4 was seated when he entered the room. They were all crowded between the door and his desk. He stood blinking, wondering why they were giving him an ovation, why Kendrick and Dacker were so ab abjectly apologetic. Great heavens, did it take the murder of the greatest Muslim since Saladin to convince people that he wasn't crazy? Before the period was over, Whitburn's secretary entered with a note in the college president's hand and over his signature, requesting Chalmers to come to his office immediately and without delay. Just like that, expecting him to walk right out of his class. He was protesting as he entered the president's office. Whitburn cut him off short. Dr. Chalmers. Whitburn had risen behind his desk as the door opened. I certainly hope that you can realize that there was nothing but the most purely coincidental connection between the event featured in this morning's newspapers and your performance a month ago in modern history for, he began. I realize nothing of the sort. The death of Khalid ibn Hussein is a fact of history, unalterably set in its proper place and time sequence. It was a fact of history a month ago, no less than today. So that's going to be your attitude, that your wild utterances of a month ago have now been vindicated as fulfilled prophecies, and I suppose you intend to exploit this, this coincidence to the utmost. The involvement of Blandley College in a mess of sensational publicity means nothing to you, I presume. I haven't any idea what you're talking about. You mean to tell me that you didn't give this story to the local newspaper, the Valley Times? Whitburn demanded. I did not. I haven't mentioned the subject to anybody connected with the Times or anybody else, for that matter, except my attorney a month ago, when you were threatening to repudiate the contract you signed with me. I suppose I'm expected to take your word for that. Yes, you are, unless you care to call me a liar in so many words. He moved a step closer. Floyd Whitburn outweighed him by fifty pounds, but most of the difference was fat. Whitburn must have realized that, too. No, no, if you say you haven't talked about it to the Valley Times, that's enough, he said hastily. But somebody did. A reporter was here not twenty minutes ago. He refused to say who had given him the story, but he wanted to question me about it. What did you tell him? I refused to make any statement whatever. I also called Colonel Tigman, the owner of the paper, and asked him, very reasonably, to suppress the story. I thought that my own position and the importance of Blandley College to this town entitled me to that much consideration. Whitburn's face became almost purple. He, he laughed at me. Newspapers don't like to be told to kill stories, not even by college presidents. That's only made things worse. Personally, I don't relish the prospect of having this publicized any more than you do. I can assure you that I shall be most guarded if any of the Times reported talk to me about it, and if I have time to get back to my class before the end of the period, I shall ask them, as a personal favor, not to discuss the matter outside. Whitburn didn't take the hint. Instead, he paced back and forth, storming about the reporter, the newspaper owner, whoever had given the story out to the paper, and finally Chalmers himself. He was livid with rage. You certainly can't imagine that when you made those remarks in class you actually possessed any knowledge of a thing that was still a month in the future. He spluttered. Why, it's ridiculous, utterly preposterous. Unusual, though, I admit, but the fact remains that I did. I should, of course, have been more careful and not confused future with past events. The students didn't understand. Whitburn half-turned, stopping short. My God, man, you are crazy, he cried, horrified. The period bell was ringing as he left Whitburn's office. That meant 
that the twenty-three students were scattering over the campus talking like mad. He shrugged. Keeping them quiet about a thing like this wouldn't have been possible in any case. When he entered his office, Stanley Weil was waiting for him. The lawyer drew him out into the hallway quickly. For God's sake, have you been talking to the papers? he demanded. After what I told you? No, but somebody has. He told about the call to Whitburn's office and the latter's behavior. Weil cursed the college president bitterly. Any time you want to get a story on the Valley Times, just order Frank Tigman not to print it. Well, if you haven't talked, don't. Suppose somebody asks me. A reporter? No comment. Anybody else? None of his damn business. And above all, don't let anybody finagle you into making any claims about knowing the future. I thought we had this under control. Now that it's out in the open, what the fool Whitburn do is anybody's gas. Leonard Fitch met him as he entered the faculty club, sizzling with excitement. Ed, this has done it, he began jubilantly. This is one nobody can laugh off. It's direct proof of precognition, and because of the prominence of the event, everybody will hear about it, and it simply can't be dismissed as coincidence. Whitburn's trying to do that. Whitburn's a fool if he is, another man said calmly, turning. He saw that the speaker was Tom Smith, one of the math professors. I figured the odds against that being chance. There are a lot of variables that might affect it one way or another, but ten to the fifteenth power is what I get for a sort of median figure. Did you give the story to the Valley Times? he asked Fitch, suspicion rising and dragging anger up after it. Of course I did, Fitch said. I'll admit I had to go behind your back and have some of my postgrads get statements from the boys in your history class, but you wouldn't talk about it yourself. Tom Smith was standing beside him. He was twenty years younger than Chalmers. He was an amateur boxer, and he had good reflexes. He caught Chalmers' arm as it was traveling back for an uppercut and held it. Take it easy, Ed. You don't want to start a slugfest in here. This is the faculty club, remember? I won't, Tom. It wouldn't prove anything if I did. He turned to Fitch. I won't talk about sending our students to pump mine, but at least you could have told me before you gave that story out. I don't know what you're sore about, Fitch defended himself. I believed you when everybody else thought you were crazy, and if I hadn't collected signed and dated statements from your boys, there'd have been no substantiation. It happens that extrasensory perception means as much to me as history does to you. I've believed in it ever since I read about Ryan's work when I was a kid. I worked in ESP for a long time. Then I had a chance to get a full professorship by coming here. And after I did, I found that I couldn't go on with it because Whitmer's president here, and he's a stupid old bigot with an air-locked mind. Yes, his anger died down as Fitch spoke. I'm glad Tom stopped me from making an ass of myself. I can see your side of it. Maybe that was the curse of the professional intellectual, an ability to see everybody's side of everything. He thought for a moment. What else did you do beside hand the story to the Valley Times? I'd better hear all about it. I phoned the secretary of the American Institute of Psionics and Parapsychology as soon as I saw this morning's paper. With the time difference to the East Coast, I got him just as he reached his office. He advised me to give the thing the widest possible publicity. He thought that would advance the recognition and study of parapsychology. A case like this can't be ignored. It will demand a serious study. Well, you got your publicity all right. I'm up to my neck with it. There was an uproar outside. The doorman was saying firmly, This is the faculty club, gentlemen. It's for members only. I don't care if you gentlemen are the press. You simply cannot come in here. We're all up to our necks in it, Smith said. Leonard, I don't care what your motives were, and you ought to have considered the effect on the rest of us first. This place will be a madhouse, Handley complained. How are we going to get any of these students to keep their minds on their work? I tell you, I don't know a confounded thing about it, Max Potguider's voice rose petulantly at the door. Are you trying to tell me that Professor Chalmers murdered some Arab? Ridiculous! End of part three. Recording by Giulio Marchini. The Edge of the Knife.
by H. Bean Piper.